Good afternoon, and welcome to our reading of The Importance of Being Earnest, a play by Oscar Wilde. In his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde wrote, Behind every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. Wilde was an Irish poet, a novelist, and a playwright who lived in the Victorian era. He was a proponent of art for art's sake, and was known for his flamboyant style and his wit as much as for his literary work. He had a promising future, born to a doctor who would go on to be knighted, and a poet who held salons in their home. He went to prestigious colleges such as Trinity College and Oxford, getting top grades and winning awards, and after graduation he had some success writing poetry, editing a ladies' periodical, and going on a speaking tour in America propounding aestheticism. He married Constance Lloyd in 1884, they had two sons, and by all accounts they seemed contented. But his greatest literary successes came in the last decade of his life. The picture of Dorian Gray in 1891, his plays Lady Windermere's Fan, A Woman of No Importance, and The Importance of Being Earnest in 1892, 3, and 4, respectively, and finally The Ballad of Reading Jail in 1898. It was also during this time that he was brought to trial for gross indecency. In 1891, he had met Lord Alfred Douglas, and shortly thereafter, the two began a relationship, something of which the Marquess of Queensbury, Douglas's father, uh, greatly disapproved. He and Wilde began a feud, which culminated in Wilde suing the Marquess for libel after the Marquess left his card at Wilde's club, openly accusing him of homosexuality. The libel suit was unsuccessful, as there was quite a bit of evidence that the Marquess was not, in fact, lying. Wilde was tried and found guilty of gross indecency and sentenced to two years of hard labor. He was released in 1897 and after that wrote his final major work, The Ballad of Reading Jail, about his experiences in prison and the execution of a fellow prisoner. He died of meningitis in Paris in 1900, having left England after his release never to return. He was only 46. The Importance of Being Earnest was written at the height of his power and is one of his most quotable works. It's also the one in which I think he best showcases his sort of fond contempt for the upper class. I hope you enjoy the play that we've got today. And after you enjoy this play, I hope that you enjoy the other virtual programming that PGC MLS is offering, both upcoming programs and recently archived on YouTube and on Facebook both the LGBTQ plus programming and the Hispanic Heritage Month programming as well. I hope you enjoy the play. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are Prince George's County Memorial Library System and in honor of LGBTQ plus History Month, we are going to be performing The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. I'll let the cast introduce themselves. I'm Chris, I'm playing John Worthing, JP, also Jack. I'm Teresa, and I'm playing Algernon. I'm Amanda, and I'm playing the Reverend Chaucible. I'm also playing Merriman and Lane. I'm Natalie, and I'm playing Lady Bracknell. I'm Storm, and I'll be playing Gwendolyn Fairfax. And I'm Kelsey, and I'll be playing Cecily, and I will also be your narrator. Um, so let's begin. First act. Scene. Morning room in Algernon's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of a piano is heard in the adjoining room. Lane is arranging afternoon tea on the table, and after the music has ceased, Algernon enters. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Hands them on a salver. Algernon inspects them, takes two, and sits down on the sofa. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shoreman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir, eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. 
I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens. Is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. So that was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir, it is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Enter Lane. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Enter Jack. Lane goes out. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating, as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Sitting down oh, on the sofa? In the country. What on earth do you do there? Jack pulls off his gloves. When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire? <laughs> Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. Algernon grabs a sandwich. By the way, Shropshire is your country, is it not? <laughs> Shropshire? Yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolen. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I am afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolen is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolen flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolen. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so furiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Jack put out his, puts out his hand to take a sandwich. Algernon at once interferes. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Algernon takes one and eats it. Well, you have been eating them all the time. That is quite a different manner. She is my aunt. Algernon takes a plate from below. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Jack advances to the table and helps himself. And very good bread and butter it is too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat it all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. Oh, that's nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? What utter nonsense you talk! 
my dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin, and before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Rings bell. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily, as far as I remember. Enter Lane. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Whirling left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Lane goes out. Do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you'd let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There's no good offering a large reward, now that the thing is found. Enter Lane with the cigarette case on a salver. Algernon takes it at once. Lane goes out. I think it, that it is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. He opens case and examines it. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You have seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to do to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't pr propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, uh, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, a charming old lady she is too. Lives at Tunbridge. Wells, just give it back to me, Algy. Algernon retreats to the back of the sofa. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From your Little Cecily with her fondest love. Jack moves to sofa and kneels upon it. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some ants are tall, some ants are not tall. That is a matter that surely an ant may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every ant should be exactly like your ant. That's absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. He follows Algernon around the room. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. You have introduced you... I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof your name is Ernest if you ever attempt to deny it to me or to Gwendolyn or to anyone else. He puts the card in his pocket. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. My dear Al <clears throat> Algie, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It's very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now, go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I am quite sure of it now. A Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? 
I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. He hands over the cigarette case. Now, produce your explanation, and pray make it improbable. He sits down on the sofa. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, under rather peculiar circumstances, and left me all the money I possess, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I sus suspected that, my dear fellow. I have been buried all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, if carried to excess, in order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and who gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That my dear Algy, is the whole truth pure and simple? The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. Now that wouldn't be a bad thing at all. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to people who haven't been at a university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you are really is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury. What nonsense. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinarily bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You'd much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, Whenever I do dine there, I am always treated as a member of the family, and sent down with either no woman at all, or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next Mary Farker, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent, and that sort of thing is enormous, enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It's rather a bore. 
So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend, who has that absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I, <clears throat> if I marry a charming girl like Gwynplaine, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life, I would marry. I certainly wouldn't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last fifty years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about it. The sound of an electric bell is heard. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolen, may I dine with you tomorrow night at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Enter Lane. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Algernon goes forward to meet them. Enter Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. She sees Jack and bows to him with icy coldness. Dear me, Gwendolyn, you are smart. I am always smart, am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I am not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. Gwendolyn and Jack sit down together in the corner. I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I've never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Algernon goes over to the tea table. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Algernon picks up the empty plate in horror. Good heavens! Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets for Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color, from what cause I, of course, could not say. Algernon crosses and hands her tea. Thank you. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's quite a delight to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. You put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Luckily, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me. But the fact is, I have just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. Algernon exchanges glances with Jack. They seem to think I should be with him. It's very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well... I must say, Algernon, that I think at high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he is going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. 
nor do I in any way approve of this modern sympathy with invalids I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice, as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation particularly at the end of the season when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen, and if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out, if you will kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. She rises and follows Algernon. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed, I believe, is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Lady Bracknell and Ad Algernon go into the music room. Gwendolyn remains behind. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else, and that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any other girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite well aware of the fact, and I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been far more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. Jack looks at her in amazement. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told, and my ideal has always been a love someone named of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest? But your name is Ernest. I, yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something else? Do you mean to tell me you couldn't love me then? Ah, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life, as we know them. Pers personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't care much about the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all. Indeed, it does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is notoriously domestic sea for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Mary, Mr. Worthy? Well, surely. You know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. 
The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity, and to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to qu tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I have got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? He goes on his knees. Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it? I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerard does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me like that, especially when there are other people present. Enter Lady Bracknell. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from the semi-recumbent posture. It is immense in decorous. Mama! He tries to rise and she restrains him. I must beg you to retire. There is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Which, what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthy, Mama. They rise together. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become t engaged to someone, I or your father, should his help permit him, will inform you of the fact. Engagement should come upon a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter she should be allowed to arrange for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn goes to the door. She and Jack blow kisses to each other behind Lady Bracknell's back. Lady Bracknell looks vaguely about as if she could not understand what the noise was. Finally, she turns round. Gwendolyn! The carriage! Yes, Mama. She goes out, looking back at Jack. Lady Bracknell sits down. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. She looks in her pocket for a notebook and pencil. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. Lady Bracknell now has her pencil and notebook in hand. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Oh, well, yes, I must admit I smoke. Mm, I am glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? At twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. Oh, I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. Lady Bracknell makes a note in her book. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and then prevents one from keeping it up. And that is all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it about... 1,500 acres, I believe, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only who make anything out of it. A country house. How many bedrooms? Well, no, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I assume. A girl with a simple, unspoiled lit nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let out by the year to, the, to Lady Bloxham. Of course, can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. 
<laughs> Nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrade Square? Uh, 149. Mm, the unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. No, they count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. Now, to minor manners, are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the Purple of Comps? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. But the fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be near to the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station, it was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me a display of contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal, conceal a social indiscretion. Has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment, it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What is it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloak room and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Good morning. Algernon, from the other room, strikes up the wedding march. Jack looks perfectly furious and goes to the door. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algy. How idiotic are you? The music stops and Algernon enters cheerily. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is a way she has. She is always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is right as a trivet. As far as she's concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a Gorgon. I don't really know what a Gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she's a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algie. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. 
My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Oh, my word. If I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years? Do you, Algie? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased, and quite as true as any observation in civilized life should be. I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? Oh, about the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her, if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris, of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy, quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say a severe chill. You're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary, or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Very well, then. My poor brother Ernest was carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of it. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Oh, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She has got a capital appetite, goes on long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty, and she is only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? One doesn't just blurt the, these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything, like that half an hour after they have met, they will be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they have called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Do you know it is nearly seven? Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Go to a theater? Oh, no. I loathe listening. Well, let us go to a club. No, I hate talking. Well, we might trot round to the Empire at ten. Oh no, I can't bear looking at things. It's so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing. It is awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work where there is no definite object of any kind. Enter Lane. Miss Fairfax. Enter Gwendolyn. Lane goes out. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. Algernon retires to the fireplace. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. 
But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deep fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Wogden, Hertfordshire. Algernon, who has been carefully listening, smiles to himself and writes the address on his shirt cuff. Then he picks up the railway guide. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate that of course will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Until Monday. Good. Algy, may, you may turn around now. Thanks. I've turned around already. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling? Certainly. Jack speaks to Lane, who now enters. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. Jack and Gwendolyn go off. Lane presents several letters on a salver to Algernon. It is to be surmised that they are bills, as Algernon, after looking at the envelopes, tears them up. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. Lane hands him the sherry. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. Enter Jack. Lane goes off. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. What on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. You don't take care. Your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only thing that are never serious. That's nonsense, Algy. You never talk about anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Jack looks indignantly at him and leaves the room. Algernon lights a cigarette, breathes his shirt cuff, and smiles. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene. Garden at the manor house. A flight of gray stone steps leads up to the house. The garden, an old-fashioned one, full of roses. Time of year, July. Basket chairs and a table covered with books are set under a large yew tree. Miss Prism is discovered seated at the table. Cecily is at the back, watering flowers. Cecily! Cecily! Surely such an utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather more to than yours? Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lessons. Cecily comes over very slowly. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed. He always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Your Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we, we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. 
you must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. You know German and geology, and things of that kind influence a man very much. Cecily begins to write in her diary. I do not think that even I could produce an effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. <gasps> I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, is speculation of profits. But I see dear, Chauc dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble! is indeed a pleasure. Canon Chasuble cool. arrives. Sorry. It's okay. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but... I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, that you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from geese. <coughs> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Etheria and her pupil any longer. Here we are. My name is Letitia, Doctor. Chasuble bows. A classical illusion, merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong? I think, dear doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the ruby, you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have the melodramatic side. Miss Prism goes down the garden with Dr. Chasuble. Cecily picks up books and throws them back on the table. Horrid political economy, horrid geography, horrid, horrid German. Merriman enters with a card on a salver. <coughs> Mr. Er, Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Cecily takes the card and read it. reads it. 
Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany, W. Uncle Jack's brother, did you call, tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. Merriman goes off. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I am so afraid he will look just like everyone else. Enter Algernon, very gay and debonair. He does! Algernon raises his hat. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than, unusual, than usually tall for my age. Algernon is rather taken aback. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I am not really wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and really being good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Algernon looks at her in amazement. Oh, of course I have been rather reckless. I am glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. I am obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life, but I still think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well, the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped a line. Yeah. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming my myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A miracle Neil? Cecily picks up scissors. No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? She cuts a flower. Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. Cecily puts the rose in his buttonhole. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. They pass into the house. Miss Prism and Dr. Chaucible return. 
You are too much alone, dear Dr. Torcible. You should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Torcible shudders. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy, celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is not a man equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended upon. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. Dr. Chasuble starts. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the schools. Enter Jack slowly from the back of the garden. He is dressed in the deepest mourning with crepe hat band and black gloves. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. Jack shakes Miss Prism's hand in a tragic manner. I have returned turn sooner than expected. Dr. Trossible, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful debts and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure? Jack shakes his head. Dead. Your brother Ernest, dead? Oh, quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Oh, poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? Uh, no, uh, he died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram late last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Chasuble raises his hand. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly, pe peculiarly susceptible to draughts. Will the, will the interment take place here? No. He seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? Possible shakes his head. I fear that that hardly points to any serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday? Jack presses his hand convulsively. My sermon on the meaning of manna in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. All sigh. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon on the behalf of the Society for Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. The bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Uh, that reminds me, you mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Trossible. I suppose you know how to christen, all right? Dr. Trossible looks astounded. Uh, I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poor classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. But 
is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But, but it is not for any child, dear doctor. I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already? I don't remember anything about it. B but have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is perfectly acceptable canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, or indeed I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you wish the ceremony to be performed? Oh, I think I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I had two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter, a more hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with the other babies. It would be childish. Would half past five do? Admirably, admirably. Possible takes out his watch. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. What seems to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me to be a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Enter Cecily from the house. Uncle Jack, oh, I am pleased to see you back, but what horrid clothes you have got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child. Cecily goes towards Jack. He kisses her brow in a melancholy manner. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had toothache and I have got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother, Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense. I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? Cecily it's runs a... back into the house. These are very joyful tidings. After all we have been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it's perfectly absurd. Enter Algernon and Cecily hand in hand. They come up slowly to Jack. Good heavens! Jack motions Algernon away. Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you, and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Jack glares at him and does not take his hand. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, who he goes to, whom, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he has been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say that I think 
that further John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. He shakes with Algernon and glares. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. They all go off except Jack and Algernon. You young scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any Bunbury in here. Enter Merriman. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I am afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has suddenly been called back to town. Yes, sir. Merriman goes back into the house. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying for a whole week with you in your house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it very unkind if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you are not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress, and with such little results. Well, at any rate, that is better than always being overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous, your conduct an outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch the 4-5, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. Jack I goes into the house. I think it has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily, and that is everything. Enter Cecily at the back of the garden. She picks up the can and begins to water the flowers. But I must see her before I go, and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Ah, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then, have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a moment's momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Enter Merriman. The dog cart is at the door, sir. Algernon looks appealingly at Cecily. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, please. 
Exit Merriman. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. She goes over to table and begins writing in diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. She puts her hand over it. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy, but pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I am quite ready for more. <clears throat> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough, she writes as Algernon speaks. Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. Enter Merriman. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Merriman looks at Cecily, who makes no sign. Yes, sir. Merriman retires. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you of course have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling. And when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or another, and after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you have wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for you leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. She kneels at table, opens box, and produces letters tied up with blue ribbon. My letters? But my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. She replaces the box. The three you wrote me I have, after I had bro broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you'd like. She shows him her diary. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? What had, what had I done? I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I am very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once, but I forgave you before the week was out. Algernon crosses to her and kneels. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. He kisses her. She puts her fingers through his hair. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes, darling. With a little help from others. I am so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. 
I don't think I could break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, of course, there is a question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. Algernon rises, Cecily also. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, my dear child, do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It is not at all a bad name. In fact, it is rather an aristocratic name. Half of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, Cecily... He moves to her. If my name was Algy, couldn't you love me? She rises. I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I fear that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. Um, Cecily. He picks up his hat. Your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church? Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. I, I mean, on most important business. Oh. I shan't be away more than half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. He kisses her and rushes down the garden. What an impetuous. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal in my diary. Thank you for joining us for the first half of Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. We hope that you'll join us next time as we finish up Act 2 and read the third and final act of the play. And until then, enjoy your LGBTQ plus history month.